Hello and welcome back to the Three Pillars Podcast. I'm your host, Chase Tobin, a.k.a. Tobinator the Motivator. The Three Pillars Podcast is that podcast that focuses on those three pillars of fitness, spiritual, mental, and physical fitness to help us grow closer to the Lord on this journey that we call life. Guys, welcome back to part two of a four-part series on the masculine virtues. Today, we're going to be discussing self-control. Um, if you followed up uh, last week, we're going to be using the book, The Intentional Father by John Tyson. If you're a father out there, to sons or daughters, doesn't matter. I highly recommend this book. I just finished it uh, the other day. I know I wanted to do a whole series on this just when I got to that particular section. I could have content for days just going over this book, but we're going to just keep it to four uh, to four sections for now. I might return to it later. Definitely check it out. Uh, Mr. Tyson has a, a fantastic take on fatherhood and, ha- and how to be intentional and to impart these masculine virtues onto our children. So that's why I wanted to do this a kind of four-part series. I hope you enjoyed last week. We're going to dive in in just a minute. But first, if you are listening to this on any of the podcast platforms, Apple, Spotify, uh, Amazon, Pandora, wherever, please leave a rating. Please leave a review. Share this to the world. Also, check us out on Good Pods. Good Pods is that podcast discovery platform that helps little guys like me get discovered and I get the message out to the masses. We're doing very well over there. Thank you all so much for your support. Uh, please make an account and go follow the show and rate the show uh, as you feel led. Uh, finally, if you're watching this on YouTube or Rumble or Odyssey, uh, same same thing there. Please subscribe to the channel, share it with your friends, and drop a comment. Let me know how you're doing. Follow me on Instagram at the Three Pillars Podcast, Facebook page Three Pillars Podcast. Check out the Three Pillars Podcast website. Pretty much anywhere you're at, you'll find me and in, in the, in the show. Uh, so thank you very much for for helping this thing grow. We're going to start out with a quick word of prayer as always, and then we're going to dive right in. So let us pray. Father God, we love you so much. Thank you for helping us to leave a life of self-control. For you give us a a sound mind, body full of power and love and discipline and self-control to help us ward off the excess. Because there's too many people in the world living in excess and they don't understand how to hone in themselves spiritually, physically, and mentally uh, to keep their focus on you. So thank you for the resources in our life. We know we're not perfect, but you put up those guardrails. Because if we didn't have your guardrails, Lord, we'd end up in a ditch. Lord, I ask that you be with me today. Give me the words to say. Give anybody tuning in this to, into this the eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive anything that grows them closer to you. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. All right. Again, I'm going to show it on the screen one more time. You'll find, I'm not going to put a link in the comments. Just look up The Intentional Father by John Tyson. I, I can't give this book enough praise. Uh, it gave me a whole new outlook on fatherhood. Um, some things I can do when my sons get older and my daughter too, but specifically for sons, because it is a, a it's tough out there being a man. Uh, it's tough out there being in a man's world because uh, the, <laughs> the world has taken away our purpose. And so this book really helps to refocus and keep young men focused on their purpose, how to learn from our fathers, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and how to impart the good onto our sons and the great that we learn from ourselves and from our studies with the Lord and everything, uh, to impart that on to um, our sons. So these virtues that we talked about last week was wisdom. Today is self-control. In the book, he presents self-control as really a cornerstone of a well-lived and an honorable life. So what is self-control? It is the ability to regulate one's emotions, our thoughts, and our behaviors in the face of temptation and impulses. It's really about exercising restraint and making conscious choices that align with our values and our long-term goals. So in this episode, we're going to really explore that importance, why, self, why, self, why self-control is important, what happens when you don't have self-control, the opposite of self-control, which is excess, and what happens if you leave a life of excess and indulgence. Obviously, we're, this is a Christian podcast. We're going to focus on scripture, uh, Christian commentaries from um, some of the church fathers, and we're going to talk about the difference between uh, self-control and excess, uh, as kind of like we did last week with wisdom and foolishness. Uh, from the book, straight out of the street from the horse's mouth, you remember last uh, week we presented Proverbs 31, the first uh, couple verses there. Um, Proverbs 31, verses 2 through 9. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I read it last week, but I talked about uh, how you shouldn't spend your strength on women. Don't drink too much. Don't let it numb you. Don't use your power or position for self-indulgence. So if you find yourself in a, in a, using your wisdom, you get a little success in life. Don't fall into this 
trap of excess and indulgence where now you are asserting authority over other people in, in, in an unjust manner or, or you're leaving this life of indulgence where you're not focused on your purpose. A very important rule, kind of a percentage rule, if you will, that you can impart to your sons or your daughters, specifically your sons, is to be 93% focused on your purpose and 7% focused on women, <laughs> as it were. Because you really should focus on getting yourself right, aligned with the Lord, aligned with your physical goals, aligned with your mental goals, your career path, what you're going to do to be a protector, a provider, and a presider before you are ready to commit yourself to a female. And this happens, you know, age 18 to 25. That's the, the range you want to shoot to, to achieve this. You know, it's, it's, it's obviously hard, but as soon as you come out of the, uh, the high school years, you're not ready for anything really, because we know how, how school is. My plan for my boys, because we homeschool, is to have them rooted in the Lord, have them well educated, uh, based off the curriculum that we have, and also have skills that they can step, take that 30 inch step forward uh, as an 18 year old into the world, and be ready to take risks and be ready to get out there and, and make something of themselves. Still having a safety net with the Lord, still being you know under our under my tutelage. Uh, but being more equipped than, he, than even I was at 18. Um, I'd like to think I was pretty well equipped. Thanks, Dad. Thanks, Mom. Um, but I want my boys to be better than me because what is a leader if he doesn't make the people that he's leading better than himself at the end of the day? That's my pledge. That's what I want to do with my boys. That's what you guys should strive to do with your family, okay? He talks about Jesus in the book, obviously. Uh, and how does Jesus sh show self-control? A little blurb here. Jesus showed remarkable self-restraint, self-control when he went to the cross. He was being attacked by the religious leaders of the day, as well as the enemy tempting him directly. But still, he held true to his purpose. He held true to his mission, and he carried it off without a hitch. Okay, that's what it means to have self-control, because when you have that self-control, you get to your mission. You absolutely accomplish it. Wondrous things happen. Okay, that's why this is so important. Now, segue, self-control, it is critical for several reasons. First and foremost, it is that foundation for your discipline and your purposeful life. Proverbs 25, 28 states, like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. This verse illustrates the vulnerability and chaos that ensue when self-control is absent. Without self-control, individuals are like a city without defenses. They're susceptible to external influences and internal turmoil. When your walls are cracked, people on the inside get really, really scared. And when the invaders come in and take over, there's chaos, there's looting, there's famine, there's starvation. All these things happen. It's, it's kind of like your life without self-control. Self-control is that wall that protects you from these, uh, these factors. Excess alcohol, pornography, promiscuity, gambling, you name it, whatever vice is out there. Being too and too hyper focused on on one thing that's not giving you uh, getting you any, anywhere closer to your your goal or to your purpose. Okay. Tyson emphasizes that self control is vital in developing moral and ethical integrity. In this book, again, he asserts that a father's role includes teaching the son the importance of self discipline and self regulation. This preparation is not merely about imposing rules, but about instilling a sense of inner strength and resilience that guides our behaviors in all of our circumstances. Secondly, self-control fosters personal growth and achievement. It enables individuals to stay focused on their goals, resist distractions, and overcome obstacles. This perseverance is crucial in all areas of life, from academic and career pursuits to personal relationships and health. Galatians 5, 22 to 23. List self-control as one of the fruits of the Spirit, highlighting its significance in leading a spiritually fulfilling and productive life. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Finally, self-control is healthy for maintaining those. Uh, it's essential for maintaining healthy relationships. It helps individuals manage emotions, communicate effectively, and avoid impulsive actions that can harm other people. When we exercise self-control, individuals can build trust, respect, and harmony in our interactions with others. Ephesians 4, 2, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Healthy relationships, why do you have to have discipline? Because when you can be resilient, when you can really focus and really reflect um, and communicate with somebody, you're not quick to anger. You're not quick to 
jump down somebody's throat, you can actually, okay, maybe what this person is telling me kind of makes my blood boil just a little bit because it's some topic that might be some hot button topic, or maybe it's something that's in the news or something that you are, are really passionate about, but you're able to channel your emotion through self-control and have a, an intellectual conversation instead of just going off the rails on somebody just because you disagree with them. Look at the political realm right now. Just because just you mention a candidate, I don't care what side of the spectrum it on. It makes people's, some people's heads spin. Now, those people, the people that are dangerous, you got to be, be careful with because they are um, emotionally unintelligent. They are uh, spiritually lacking and they are physically weak people because they cannot uh, control their emotions. You should be able to mention a political candidate without losing your mind. OK, whether it's right now we got uh, Harrison Trump. Right. If you say those names in certain circles, some people are going to lose their minds for no reason whatsoever. OK. You should be able to control and regulate those emotions and have healthy relationships, even with people you disagree with. Good to go. So what happens if you lack self-control? Segue. Man, I'm getting good at this. I'm getting good at this. The absence of self-control can lead to detrimental outcomes for both the individual and those around them. When someone lacks self-control, they are more likely to engage in impulsive and reckless behavior. When you don't have restraint, this can really make you... Uh, it sets you up for personal and professional failures. It can damage your relationships and it can diminish your quality of life. If you don't have self-control, you can fall into addictive behaviors. And some of these addictive behaviors become destructive habits. If you do them over and over and over again, when you do a behavior for, what, 21 days, it becomes a habit. If you find yourself drinking in excess, if you find yourself down the, the pornography rabbit hole, if you find yourself leading a promis uh, promiscuous life, drugs, what you name it. These things can be self-destructive. Proverbs 20, 30, I'm sorry, Proverbs 23, 20 through 21. Do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat. Man, I wish I had that <laughs> uh, back in the day, but it's okay. I'm learning. For drunkards and gluttons become poor and drowsiness clothes them in rags. This verse, again, tells us about the dangers of excess and the importance of self-regulation. When we're, if we are to maintain a balanced and prosperous life, if you're throwing all your money at drugs and alcohol, if you're spending money on you know, just going out all the time just because you're trying to get um, have relations with women, right? You're going to end up broke and you're going to end up not having anything to save. You're not going to have anything for when you are ready to settle down. You're, you're going to be way behind because you haven't developed a little nest egg. 93% on your purpose, 7% on chase women, guys. Ladies, same thing. Don't be a drain on the resources, though. That's for ladies. I'll let Leah come and talk about what, uh, what ladies should do and what feminine virtues are. Maybe that's maybe that's the next next month is feminine virtues. Put that in the old computer bank. We'll see. Your lack of self-control, it undermines your credibility and respect also. If you're a leader and you lack self-discipline, you're going to struggle to inspire and guide others effectively. Because of your lack of discipline, your subordinates are, are going to be erratic and self-serving. Ultimately, you're going to lead, it's going to lead to a destructive workplace because there's no trust. There's no trust in authority. Um, you have poor team morale, decreased productivity in your, and, and that's if uh, from a military standpoint, let's just say, if you have no self-control and your team doesn't have self-control, nobody can count on you to get the job done. You might be bare bones minimum. Maybe you get, maybe the, you are forced to be put at the back of the, the rotation because Nobody can count on you to get, to get it done. How does that make you feel? What kind of morale does that have? And then as the leader, you're going to get angry because people aren't doing what you need them to do. But it's because you have no self-control that your team doesn't have self-control. You are the representative, that they're, the example by which they are going to follow because you are generally a little bit older if you're a leader. And your younger guys are going to look up to you because you are that source of authority, whether you want it to be or not. Just like being a parent, just like being a big brother, just like putting yourself on social media, what people see, you never know who's watching. OK, there might be young, young men and, and, and women that listen to this podcast. There might be young men and women that follow you on Facebook or social media or something like that. What they see, they, they will mimic. Monkey see, monkey do. OK, I can't tell you how many times I'm going around the house singing some little ditty bobbing song. Usually I don't sing anything, anything bad, but I'll sing a song in the house. Next thing you know, my kids are all singing it. They're always watching. They're always listening. So you've got to be mindful of these things. OK, OK. In your personal relationships, again miscommunications, misunderstanding, conflicts, and alienation because you have no discipline, no self -discipline. Finally, the absence of self-control control leaves individuals vulnerable to external pressures and manipulation. Without the ability to resist temptations and make independent choices, thinking freely, 
Individuals are at a higher risk of falling prey to harmful influences and to peer pressure. James 1, 14 to 15. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Kind of sounds like Yoda, right? Fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, hate leads to suffering kind of stuff. It's, it, it's, it reminds me of that. I don't know. You guys tell me. But once you see that thing that's tempted you, okay, mm -mm, I like that. I'm going to go get it. And maybe I have to I end up sinning because I want to get it. Because think about David and Bathsheba, right? Mm, he saw her bathing. Got him excited, right? Sent her husband off to the front line so he could commit adultery with her. And eventually that, it's a self-destructive behavior, right? And again, people will argue with me. Well, if, no, if nobody's really hurting bodies, two consenting adults, blah, 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 adults do adult things. Yeah, but in the long term, I'll be married 10 years this year. I've got a wife and three children. Why on earth, all the work that I've put into this, why on in the world would I want to give that up for just some random female? Now, there are dudes who would do that because they're not happy at home. Because they are lacking wisdom. They are lacking self-discipline. They are lacking courage. They are lacking justice. They have not established a, a well-ordered home because on the front end, they didn't do their homework and they end up stuck with a lady they don't want to want to be with the rest of their life. That's why it's one of the most important decisions you can make, gents, is to find the right wife. And then once you start having kids now, you can start imparting these knowledge and this wisdom onto them. Okay. I'm not saying people are, are all evil, but this happens all the time. And a lot of it's just self-induced friction. Sometimes, ladies and gents, you got to get married. If you get married, the love comes later. People don't understand that. But go back and listen to my whole spiel with Lee and I. We did a, a whole series on family, marriage and family, healthy intimacy, all that stuff. Go back and check it out. You can just uh, Google that uh, or look look through the, the podcast on YouTube or wherever, and you'll find that episode. I know one's, I think, 75, and another one's uh, pretty recently. But you have to have a healthy relationship at home, so you won't be as tempted about these things. Because if you're happy at home, you know, you go to the gym and you see a girl in you know, and whatever she's wearing, you're going to be like, whatever, I'm just here to get a lift in, as opposed to really trying to pursue that because you're not happy at home. Okay. I'm just hypothetically spitting things out. These are scenarios that happen all over the place. And a lot of it is because there is lack of self-discipline, especially among men and among women too. Your lack of self-discipline, ladies, will lead men off the path. Okay. Yes, men need to be stronger, 1,000%. But you guys need to make sure you do your part as well. Okay. Hopefully I'm stepping on toes. Now, what is excess? What is its impact? So excess is a state of exceeding reasonable or proper limits, particularly in behavior or consumption. This involves an overindulgence in pleasures and desires. This leads to a lack of balance and self-restraint. Excess can manifest in various forms. Things like overeating, overdrinking, overspending, and overworking. Each form of excess brings its own set of consequences impacting one's physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. We talked very early in the podcast, I want to say it was like episode 7, about balance. OK, we're talking about our wheel of equilibrium, all these little spokes in the wheel. The, the center point is your balance and all these different things will pull you aside. You know, your social life, work, finances, gym, what all these things. But eventually you, you want to get people resilient enough to get back to the center. Right. My wheel of equilibrium. We've talked about it a couple of times. Overworking. Focus so much on that. You're not with your your family. Overspending to not that your, your finances are strained. Your family life is strained because you don't have money for to go on vacation, to do fun stuff, to, uh, to go out to dinner, you know, once in a while or, or whatever you're and overspending and over drinking go hand in hand, because if you're overindulging on drinking or drugs or whatever, now your cash flows down and it's just going to cause problem after problem. These things layer on each other. Okay. So you, this indulgence while people say, Oh, it's, you know, it's, it's a victimless crime. You know, somebody drinking or doing drugs, blah, blah. There are second and third order effects that nobody wants to talk about because it actually holds someone accountable, generally that person or the people that are around them. Somebody has to be accountable for the behavior because ultimately somebody is suffering. Okay. Everybody says, you know, you know, my rights begin where your rights end or something like that. There's some stupid saying that's out there like that, but it's true. If I am doing, if I am overindulging and just focused on myself, my family suffers. 
Why would I want to put them through that? Why would I want to put them through struggle? I want them to be as successful and happy and taken care of as possible. But if I'm focused on myself and my needs, now we've got problems. Okay. Let's talk about the physical impact. Three pillars, right? Excessive behavior often leads to physical health problems. Overeating and excessive drinking, for instance, results in obesity, liver disease, and other chronic health conditions. The lack of physical self-control compromises the body's natural balance and it leads to long-term health issues that diminishes the quality of life. When you live a life of excess, it can also take a toll on your emotional and mental health. The constant pursuit of pleasure and immediate gratification can lead to feelings of emptiness, dissatisfaction, and anxiety. Been there, done that, okay? We've talked about it before. Ecclesiastes 2, 10 to 11. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward from all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind, and nothing was gained under the sun. I have been there, ladies and gents. I was an overindulgent alcohol and in women. I have said it before. Thank God my wife uh, saved me due to the divine intervention and, and grace of the Lord. Looking back at my life before, it was uh, meaningless and it was chasing after the wind because I, at the end of the day, sometimes I felt specifically alone and anxious and like, what am I actually doing? But then the quick fixes over and over again kind of helped it, but it was just like putting a Band-Aid on a hemorrhage. Now in a true, healthy, wonderful, meaningful relationship, I truly, truly have peace uh, with my family, with my lifestyle, with the Lord, mentally, spiritually, physically. Came out of it, and you guys can too if you're struggling with that. Again, excess. It can really hurt you. Same thing with finance. We talked about that before. Proverbs 21, 20, the wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools go up theirs down. The inability to manage your finances responsibly can result in a cycle of borrowing and spending that jeopardizes your financial security and future opportunities. You run up a credit card. You can't pay your mortgage. You can't pay your car. It gets, something gets repoed. You get house in foreclosure. Then you get evicted. This, that, and the third. Because you couldn't put the bottle down. You couldn't stop whatever. You don't have the house that you want. You don't have the life that you want because you are uh, overindulging and you're using that as, as an excuse because... You know, so it's like the fat guy in Austin Powers. I eat because I'm unhappy and I'm unhappy because I eat. He's, you got to break this cycle. Okay. What about the spiritual impact? Spirituality. Spiritually, here we, I should say, excess draws individuals away from their relationship with God. It fosters a focus on material and worldly pleasures rather than spiritual growth and fulfillment. This misalignment can lead to a sense of spiritual emptiness and separation from one's faith. 1 John 2, 15 to 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. This world is fleeting. Okay, There are beautiful things in the world, but when you indulge on it, you focus on that so much you lose sight of the Father. I encourage you to keep your eyes on the Father and the worldly things will become more beautiful and they will be replaced with the lovely things of the Father, not the things that are in excess that are going to tempt you into your own destruction. So what happens if you leave a life defined by excess? The immediate effect, again, is personal instability. You're going to create a cycle of dependency and addiction and it's going to make, make it very difficult for you to maintain control over your life. The inability and instability to, to live that live your life, it's going to manifest in various forms. You're going to, again, health issues, financial troubles, and your relationships are going to be strained. Proverbs 25, 16, if you find honey, eat just enough. If you eat too much of it, you're going to vomit. This verse illustrates the principle that even good things can become harmful when consumed in excess. The lack of moderation, that's a key word. It's going to disrupt the natural balance and harm you for life. You can have a drink, okay, with have a nice drink with dinner. But don't get to the point where you're blackout. Don't get to the point where you lose your faculties. Drugs are, are different because you can take, you know, one hit of, of marijuana or cocaine or something like that, and it can truly alter your mind and your and your state and your focus. Okay. One beer is not gonna gonna do that. If again, if if you're doing it in these things in moderation. Drugs are wildly different because they can hit you differently. And some people's like, oh well, you know, build up a tolerance to it. Yeah, but now 
why why do you feel like you have to do this thing? And the same thing can be said for alcohol. Why do you feel like you have to have a, a beer with your steak? I think it makes it taste good. That's just me. Why do I like whiskey? Whiskey because it tastes good. I'm not going to drink the whole bottle because then I'll be no good to my family or to anyone. But a little sniffer once in a while, keep it real, okay? Moderation is key. Talk about honey, eat too much, you're going to throw up. A life led by excess, it results in missed opportunities. These excessive behaviors distract you from your goals and your responsibilities. Your potential is going to be unfulfilled and you're going to be filled with lots and lots of regret because, man, I could have done so much more, but I was broke. Or I could have done so much more, I was unhealthy. I could have done so much, so much more, but I got myself in a situation relationship-wise where I couldn't get out and I couldn't actually enjoy uh, the happiness that the Lord wants for me because I tied myself down to a male or a female that was ungodly and it's going to keep me in this life of excess. This pursuit of immediate pleasures and indulgences, it overshadows your pursuit of meaningful and lasting achievements. 93% on your purpose, 7% on all that other stuff. On a much deeper level, excess erodes your character. When you constantly give in to temptations and desires, you can find yourself hopeless and, and truly filled with self-doubt. Over time, this can manifest as a lack of integrity, as many individuals resort to dishonest or unethical behavior to sustain these excessive lifestyles. Man, I, I'm addicted to alcohol or drugs, but I can't afford it. Maybe I got to go steal something or maybe I got to do something I'm going to regret in order to get my fix. Titus 2, 11 through 12, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. The grace of the Lord, it saves you from sin, but it doesn't give you the power to continue to sin. It helps you to be filled with the grace of the Lord and filled with the goodness of the Lord and to sin no more. Jesus sat down at the table of all the sinners that were out there. And everybody's like, oh, yeah, he welcomed everybody to the table. Yes, we want everybody to sit at the table. We also want to change the lifestyle that is leading them into self-destruction and to help them go forth into the world and sin no more. People forget the second part of that verse way too often in the world. So how do these things compare and contrast? Self-control promotes stability. Self-control is that foundation. It's that balance in one life, in, in your life. Chaos and instability is the opposite. That's what happens with excess. Proverbs 16, 32, better a patient person than a warrior, one with self-control than one who takes a city. Sometimes you have to let things play out before you make uh, make an attack. Having the self-control, taking it all in, being tactful about things, then going in for your, your mission, okay? Your physical health, your financial stability, all that comes with self-control. But if you have that excess, you're not going to be prepared for the challenges because you haven't. We talked about preparation a couple of weeks ago. You're not prepared because you have not you have overindulged so much you haven't done any time to to prepare for what you need to do. Self-control fosters growth. It's a catalyst for personal and professional growth. It enables individuals to stay focused on their goals, resist distractions, and overcome obstacles. Second Peter 1, 5 through 6 emphasize the importance of this spiritual growth because it states, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control. And to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness. Excess, on the other hand, that's that immediate gratification. It's distracting, and it's stagnant. It's going to uh, make you stagnant. You're not going to grow. And your full potential is going to be absolutely wasted. You are worth it. The, God, the Lord, the creator of heaven and earth, wants you to have your maximum potential. But the devil wants to tempt you and to keep you in a state of sedation and stagnation. If you want lasting success, have self-control. Self-control commands respect. When you exhibit self-discipline and restraint, that's admired by people because you're able to manage your emotions, you're able to manage your thoughts, and you're able to manage your behavior. This consistent and thoughtful action, it, it builds trust in your the people you're leading and the people that you're working with. Proverbs 25, 28, like a city whose walls are broken through a person is a person who lacks self-control, just like we talked about at the beginning. When you have self-control, you have strong walls. We no self-control, your walls are going to crumble and you're going to get walked all over. You're going to be easily manipulated and you're going to be led to slaughter at the, end of, uh, at the end. Again, to contrast, excess leads to a loss of respect and credibility. Okay, When you lack self-discipline and you indulge in these behaviors, people are going to see you as irresponsible and you're not going to be called upon to do the things that you probably could do but people aren't going to trust you to, to do those things. So what is, 
how, how do we develop the self-control? Well, it's for, through faith. They're deeply interconnected. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, again, talks about the fruits of the Spirit and how self-control and spirituality leads to that productive and filling life. Augustine of Hippo, in his Confessions, he writes, You have made for us yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. This statement he makes underscores a belief that true self-control is rooted in a relationship with God and guidance in the Holy Spirit. It is a moral compass, your faith. It guides individuals to making these ethical decisions and to exercise your self-control. It instills the values, honesty, integrity, compassion, other virtues that are out there. These are all components of self-discipline. Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. When you adhere to these values and principles, you can develop a wise and discerning character that exercises self-control in all circumstances. So practical things to apply self-control. Set clear goals to define your clear vision. What you want to achieve is going to help you stay focused and help narrow your narrow your search so you're not tempted by all these outsides. I'm, I'm not quite like putting blinders on, but like I said earlier, putting guardrails so you don't end up in a ditch so you can get to that goal and not, and not let things on the outside. Putting walls up on this path you're walking so the things on the outside can't get to you. Develop healthy habits. What you read, what you eat, what you consume, what you listen to. All these things, putting it into a, a routine, a mindful routine, are going to make it easier to exercise self-control. Be mindful of your thoughts and your emotions. Don't let yourself... Uh, wander off too much because the idle hands are, are our devil's plaything, right? Fill your day with a, with a positive routine. Find accountability, whether it's an accountability partner, um, a small group session, church, what have you. That accountability is going to help you practice this mindfulness and, and, and increase your self-control and focus so you can have that 93% and that 7% on the, the other things, right? The other things. Make sure you reflect and you learn on your experiences. Learn from people around you. Learn from your successes and from your failures. Consider what worked and consider what didn't and how you can improve yourself. Reflect on this self-evaluation. That is part of self-discipline and self-reliance and self-resilience because you're going to have a deeper understanding of yourself and help enhance your own ability uh, to exercise itself. So to conclude, self-control, vital to a man's character and development, vital to your decisions, vital to your life path. It is a foundational virtue. It's going to help you live a purposeful life. It's going to foster your personal growth, foster your professional growth, foster your achievement, foster your uh, relationships with others. The lack of self-control or excess is going to lead you down a self-destructive path of instability, missed opportunities, and compromised character. Faith plays a crucial role as well in maintaining self-control. Faith offers strength. It offers guidance. It offers that sense of purpose. This enables you to navigate your challenges and temptations with resilience and with discernment. When you set the goals, when you develop healthy habits, when you practice mindfulness, when you seek accountability, when you reflect on experiences, all these things, they're going to help you cultivate and apply the self-control in all aspects of life so you can walk confidently in your self-control, in your relationship with the Lord, in your training and your and your research and everything that you do to, to be a well-rounded, self-disciplined person, that you can be a force to be reckoned with and a person of consequence. Again, the intentional father is what we're going to be continuing on this week. You can pass all this on to your sons by leading your example and then showing them by real-time examples of what happens when somebody is indulging too much and what happens when somebody is still um, on the right path. Okay, Somebody who's straying, somebody's on the right path. Somebody who is straying from the right path into uh, from the wrong path onto the right path. You can impart that onto your sons, but you have to be intentional. Make sure, like I said in Proverbs 25, your walls are strong. Because if they're broken, that's like not having self-control and it's going to crumble to outside pressure. The advice in this book, the advice in this podcast, I hope it resonates with you. And helps you understand why self-control is so important. And why you should pursue it with all that you have. Because it is one of the bedrock virtues of a life well lived and a character well formed. Guys, I'm Chase Tobin. This is the Three Pillars Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. That's all I got for you. Go to the beginning, listen to the whole housekeeping spiel. I'm not going to repeat it, but make sure you follow us on the platforms. Like and share this if you enjoyed this. We're going to end it with a quick word of prayer. And I'm going to kick you guys out for a fantastic weekend. Thank you for joining me this week on the Three Pillars Podcast. 
Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you for being our bedrock. Thank you for being our foundation. Thank you for being uh, a guiding light and resource to us. Thank you for showing what it means to have self-control and how we can apply that to others in our lives, that we can all better serve you and come together and further your kingdom, Lord. Lord, I ask that anybody tuning into this, that you bless them, that you help them to be the best that they possibly can be, and that you instill them with your virtues and your love and your accountability. Because when we're accountable to you, Lord, we will we will make sure that we get the job done. Lord, I ask all this in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. All right, guys, God bless you all. Thank you again for tuning in. I'm Chase Tobin, a.k.a. Tobinator the Motivator. Until next time, Tobinator, out.